Welcome to the Leverage Through Podcast. This is where high performers bring you three tactics that you can leverage today to impact your business, brand, and well being. I'm Craig Shoemaker, and today's guest is Colin Chung. Now, Colin breaks down how humans are influenced and form beliefs and regularly delivers bangers on Twitter about how to do excellent copywriting. Colin, welcome to the show. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much, Craig. So I've been talking to a number of different people who have been publishing incredible content on Twitter, and you are certainly among the group of people who are just so original and so individual in the way that you present information. I got to think that's on purpose. So tell me a little bit about like your philosophy of, of publishing online. So what do you mean by original? Because I'm not sure what I'm teaching is. It's not different from what I learned, but it is different from what's available on Twitter, I think. I think there's a lot of copywriters on there, but not many who are direct response copywriters. And furthermore, direct response copywriters who write long form copy. Right. Yeah. So I, I certainly there's nothing new under the sun. And so, uh, you know, in terms of originality, I think it comes from your tone and it comes oh. from your style. I think it comes from your delivery. OK, well, that that is um, that's just me. Uh, I, I've, I've always had my own voice. I'm well, not always. I developed it as a writer over the last 15, 20 years. So it's not, I think hmm, a good tangent would be that I took improv um, two years ago or started taking improv in comedy. And if there's anything I learned from improv, um, it's more about just shutting down the filters in your head and saying exactly what's in your mind. And maybe that's what's coming through because I've always been a blunt uh, forward person and that defines my originality, I guess. Right. Um, I'm not afraid to say what's on my mind or I don't, I don't think it's even emotions. I think the problem is I don't have a filter and I just say <laughs> what it is there. Right. So. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, one of the things that we wanted to talk about today was kind of how you reach people, how you uh, segment them out and and yeah. classify people right so yeah so sophistication levels and things of that nature yeah so there is a, a copywriting book um that was written in 1966 by eugene schwartz one of the greatest copywriters who ever lived called breakthrough advertising and this is there's there's a section in that book that talks about sophistication and awareness levels and i in all the copywriting courses and books I've read and studied, it has not shown up anywhere else except for one course, which is now out hmm. of print. Um, and I, I, I'm pretty sure they teach this stuff in like um, college or university if you take marketing, but I never took those courses. Um, I mean, I'm, yeah, let, let's talk about them because if you're a creator, or if you're a freelance copywriter uh, or someone who's looking to find that perfect market match, like if you're a founder or an entrepreneur, uh, these are extremely important things to think about. Uh, so we can talk about awareness and um, sophistication. And what awareness is, um, is, our, is your market, do they, do they even know about your product or the problem they have? Mm. Okay, so um, I'll talk through the five levels of awareness, and then we can use examples. And I'm sure you'll come up with some examples too, Craig. Yeah. Um, all right. So the most aware, uh, they know what the product is, what it does, and already want it. So when you walk into like CVS or Walgreens or um, up here we got Shoppers Drug Mart or London Drugs, and you're buying like a toothbrush or toothpaste or like you know. Uh, whatever you get at a uh, uh, drug mart like that, you you know what you're looking for. Right. Right. Um, and that's why when you go to stores like that, like Walmart, um, at the end of the day, really, you're, you're shopping based on price. Building a business is tough and even tougher when you do it alone. So why not use proven systems to help grow your business and focus your message? Now, Dan Coe is the creator's creator. 
His system found in the two hour writer helps you cultivate your best ideas. And the modern mastery community is there to challenge and support your growth every step of the way. I'm there and you should be too. So go to leverage3podcast.com slash co that's K O E. Let's get you going. And the second level is they know what it is, but they, but doesn't yet want, they don't want it yet. So they know what the product is, but may, they not know what it does yet, or they're not convinced yet. So that would be like a newer product that has done very well. Brand marketing was you're aware of it, but you don't know exactly if it's exactly what you want yet. So is it like you, you don't know if you have this problem that it's trying to solve? Um, I, you, you know, it solves the problem, but you don't know how it solves the problem and you're not convinced okay. yet. So, um, a lot of fitness programs, like before the P90X was big, I mean, everybody knew what it was because of the infomercials, right? but you weren't clear on how it did it and okay. whether it would work for you. So it was just um, like, you knew it worked for other people, but you didn't know specifically as a potential buyer, whether or not it was going to fit my lifestyle, exactly. that kind of thing. Yeah. All right. So the third state of awareness is a new product uh, for desires. They know what they want and can see how your product helps them once they've been introduced to it. So they're not even aware of your product. Okay. This is where most creators play. Um, most uh, creators online or internet marketers, they create products that they know there's a market for, but you're introducing a product to them um, and they know the result you can promise, but they don't know of your product yet. Right. And you need to explain what your product does for them. Um, next level down is pro product that solves needs. They know what their problem is, but they're not aware of products that, that can help. So like, this one's like the one that they used in 1966 was corns as in like if you have a corn on your toe um <laughs> right. and the ad, the ad is pretty simple it's like oh um a good recent or not recent i mean i'm dating myself but do you remember um that stupid pain relief thing head on and then you just touch it and then it gets rid of the pain i don't No. it was a really dumb ad but <laughs> i mean it was very clear on what it did is it solves it's pain relief right um so you know what your problem is as a market, but you're not aware of the type of products that can help. So it's kind of like, I mean, before the internet, um, like there would be all these weird little, like not necessarily diseases, but like, you know, weird things like a tag or acne or whatever. And you, you know, it's a problem, right? But the only way for you to find out what helps is like calling up your mother or your grandmother or talking to your friends. Right. So that's kind of where the fourth state of awareness is, where where you have a clear problem. You've never you don't know how to define it, um, but there are there are solutions out there. So are these states of awareness is this when you're looking at them, is it a life cycle that your product goes through or is that a life cycle that your customer goes through? Both, both. Mm. Right. I mean. 150 years ago, we didn't wash ourselves with soap, right? Right. So some, like the, the people making soap, they had um, salespeople going up and down the country, knocking on doors, convincing people to use soap. Right. And if you go to a, a developing country, we smell weird to them because we're clean. <laughs> and so like, if you think about it, um, that awareness changed over the generation so like at the beginning we didn't even know that that was a problem mm. right? The, right the the people making soap convinced us that that was a problem right it made our life better obviously but like right. we didn't think it was a problem yet right um and then once that awareness is set in into that particular generation of our great grandparents they pass it lot down and now we don't need marketing to buy soap we know we need to buy soap right I mean, the only biggest, the biggest uh, change in that market is I use body wash instead of soap now because soap is annoying. Right. But um, that awareness level for the market and the, the customer changes, but the product um, also, the, their marketing has to change. So it goes from 
a long form copy in the sense of a salesperson coming to your house, knocking on your door, talking to you for 20 minutes to convince you to buy soap to now where Dove will do like an identity campaign. Like it's for all women. So it's a completely different type of market marketing based on the last 150 years. So like brand marketing took off uh, in the seventies, eighties, because it was like, they realized everybody uses soap. Everybody uses shampoo. How do we differentiate ourselves? Right. So like, I mean, I forget where I heard it, but like all shampoo comes from like the same factories in China or something. The difference is each brand will change the scent and make it about your identity. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've totally heard the same thing. Um, so the final state of awareness is they're completely unaware market. So they don't know what they want. They're not aware of their desired needs or, or the need is vague and amorphous. So this is like uh, when Uber first came out, where Airbnb first came out, when the iPhone first came out, we didn't really necessarily want it. We didn't know of the desire or need to use it, but Steve Jobs and um, the people behind Uber and Airbnb said, hey, check this out. It's super useful. I remember with the iPad, I looked at it and I was like, I don't know why we need a bigger iPod touch. Right. Yep. And now I use yeah, yeah. my iPad constantly every single day. Exactly. And those, that one's like, it's not so much about copywriting and marketing as, well, I guess it is marketing, but it's a totally different level of marketing that I don't know. I, I wouldn't know how to do it properly. Um, mm. I know Airbnb, like you would have to read up on the stories. I know, I know the Airbnb guys did a lot of like um, customer check-ins at the very beginning, like they would visit every Airbnb in New York city and go, why did you guys do this? This is a crazy, (laughs) stupid idea. And they would talk to them. And then they found out exactly, this is, this is basically startup territory. They've got a crazy new innovative idea and you want to see if there is a product market match and you don't know until you go hit the ground, talk to your customers and find out why they took this crazy risk of, putting their house up for strangers. Right. Yeah. I mean, it seems insane in the beginning before Mm -hmm. there's any, anything to prove that the model works and it's secure and you know, all that to to go with it. Exactly. So as a copywriter and marketer, um, you always want to know exactly where you're at in the five states of awareness, because that tells you how much copy you need and, or the, style of marketing. So like if, if they're aware of your product and they know what it is and and they want it already, the only game you have is pricing. That's Mm -hmm. it. Coupons, uh, convincing them, come to the store. Um, there, you can't, there's no, no copy will save you. It's just, you're having, you're, you're in a price war with your competitors. So how do you know where you're at in the awareness spectrum? just being aware of your market and the product you're selling. So like I'm always in the third state or maybe in the fourth state. Mm. Cause whenever I'm selling, when I write long form copy for clients, it's selling a course or a supplement or financial newsletter. They're, they, they're aware of their problem. They just don't know what the solution is or they they're aware of other solutions and they're choosing between the different solutions, but all of them are, um, they're hard to define um, as in like, is one trading strategy better than another trading strategy? They don't really know. And my job as a copywriter is to convince, well, the one my guru is selling is the best trading strategy (laughs) or whatever. Gotcha. Okay. So So, go uh, ahead. No, I'm good. Okay. Well, so I was going to say, you you have the, the different levels of awareness and then it sounds like you're using uh, either customer research or just anecdotal uh, contacts with right. people to kind of figure out where you're at. Yeah, you you really have to know where your market is and what their awareness of the problem is and awareness of the product. So it's a combination of researching um, them, surveying them, talking to them, uh, stalking them on uh, subreddits, Amazon reviews, um, and just understanding where they're at. Uh, And if you can't find anything that tells you, oh, you're way on the bottom, like, um, and there's potential for like making a lot of money there. 
but you also have to be aware that that's a problem that people are complaining about, but they don't know how to solve it. Mm. So like a potentially good solution, uh, good example might be um, that thing you put on the phone or phone cases, right? Like we didn't really think we needed that. And people weren't aware. like when we first started buying iPhones, there weren't cases yet. Right. But then somebody realized, oh, if you drop this thing, that's like <laughs> 600 $700 down the drain. Right. And then all those phone case companies came along and started make, making cases. Right. So that's a need that we were not aware of when we got an iPhone back in. 20, Whenever it was. Yeah. 2012, But I can tell you the first person to drop their iPhone probably only had it for about four and a half minutes. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So, so we have these, these awareness levels and then, so once you have that understanding, then at that point you're, you're building it or you're building your sophistication models. Sophistication is the next thing. So sophistication, there's five states as well. Um, so sophistication, um, sophistication is how many similar products there are in your market. So again, so like if we're talking about awareness that way, that's way down there, there won't be a sophistication because people aren't even aware of it. Okay. Um, but if it's the word is high, then people are aware of all the different things and how you sell the product. Um, it, it, it's dependent on how sophisticated the market is. So let's, let's go through the different levels of sophistication and then we can start. So what I did eventually was I combined sophistication awareness levels into this matrix. And there's a lot more thought process to it. Um, and it is something I'm summarizing eventually for my newsletter. And we mm. can talk about that too. Um, all right. So sophistication levels are like, if you're the product maker and you're first, you have first mover advantage. Therefore you just need to be direct. Here's what it does. Here's why you need it. Okay, but if you're second, if you're like Pepsi or Reebok, now you have to quantify why yours is better than the first mover. Okay. Okay. If you're third to the market or more, now the third level of sophistication is uh, you have to explain mechanistically how your product is, does, is better. Okay, so let's, let's talk about that. So second, when you quantify it, you're just saying mine is better because it delivers better results or it, uh, it's cheaper, or um, it's more accurate. All I okay. have to do is make a claim, right. okay? But if you're like the third one in, or now you're in a war between like Coke and Pepsi, you're having war, now you have to describe the mechanism of it. Okay. And the mechanism is how it works. So then Coke can say, well, we have a secret recipe. Right. Um, mechanism is what mixed like it, it, it's what how the product works um what's a good example for that um what about so cell phones in the book which sorry what, what about cell phones like difference between an oh, iphone yeah, yeah, yeah. and a the, different features yeah that's a perfect example um so uh in the book it's like instead of just saying it cleans sheets you add with the power of optical brighteners so you're talking about some science whether it's true or not that happens inside um the product okay so now that that's tend to be that tends to be where i play on the third level of sophistication everybody knows what weight loss products are everybody knows what how to get rich on the stock market like buy this stock buy that stock and my argument the core arguments i can make are typically well this works better because of this mechanism inside the product so instead of using uh puts and calls we will use iron butterflies or whatever options instead of um hey eating less and exercising more we have this supplement that blocks leptin or gotcha okay so whatever so, we'll, so when you're talking about sophistication it's not necessarily the sophistication of the product or the company it's the sophistication of the consumer understanding yes. whether or not yes this thing exists yes. it can help me and how it will help me Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Um, and then the fourth stage of sophistication is mechanism. Plus now you have to actually back it up with results. Okay. So it's one thing. So like m ms had the best campaign ever at the third level, which was melts in your mouth, not in your hands. Right. 
So that's the mechanism. So like if for some reason somebody else came up with that and for some reason the market believed that this was better than M&Ms, then <laughs> M&Ms would have to say something like, well, um, it doesn't melt in your hand for like three hours <laughs> and then the, it, it's better than the other guys. I mean, that would never really happen because right. it would just look like a weird copycat. But there are certain markets and products where you have to start saying, yeah, we got the same mechanism, but it does better. Right. It does it faster um, or longer. The joke I make is like the, the six minute ads from uh, what's her name? Something about Mary. Oh, right. Yeah. There's that one scene where it's like, you know what? I just came up with the best product idea. It's five minute ads. Cause <laughs> I figure, you know, everybody wants ads faster than six minute ads. Right. 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 <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so there's that. That's the third stage, fourth stage. And then fifth is like, your product is dead. Like, why are you even coming into this market? Uh, so like, not Lyft, but like close enough, like Uber, Lyft. There was a third one that was kind of like absurdly, like, why are you even trying? Mm. Um, so that's when you have to shift your marketing altogether and find a completely new market. Um, my favorite example for this is, um, have you ever heard of the jitterbug? Mm -mm. So it's like, it's basically a flip phone with really big buttons. Okay. And you're like, why would this be coming out? They it's for were grandpa. extremely smart. What? It's for grandpa, right? Exactly. Yeah. They were so smart about it. <laughs> they basically come up, came up with a super basic phone and it's like no texting, right. no, uh, you know, apps, no crazy features. It just helps you call your grandkids. Right. And it was just so brilliant. It was sold in uh, AARP and other like uh, magazines in the back with like a full page ad. Right. Um, which is very clever, very smart. Um, but that's when, or, or another good example is your product just died as in like your market dried up. So now your, your, your job as a marketer is go, well, who else can we sell this to? So Listerine is a great example. Um, for the longest time it was for cleaning. Like you literally used it to clean your floors. <laughs> and then they were like, oh, no. well, how can we change the market? Well, maybe you should put it in your mouth to clean out this thing we made up called halitosis. <laughs> so now you're switching your product market completely. Right. Um, and there's other examples um, and I wrote them down somewhere, but you kind of get where I'm coming from. Like if mm -hmm. your product becomes dead to your market, now you need to create it for a new market. Um, I wrote down MySpace. MySpace had a good pivot near the end of its life where it's more, hey, this is for music and entertainers. Because mm -hmm. well, as soon as Facebook came along, it, you know, ate to lunch. Yeah. But they did pivot for a while right. before they sold to Yahoo or AOL. I forget who they sold to. I stopped paying attention so long ago. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Red Roof is a good example. They were a chain of hotels and during the uh, pandemic, they converted their rooms into remote offices or offices for remote workers. Hmm. But yeah, that's, that's the kind of game. You, so like now you're not thinking about copy, you're thinking about more of a business strategy and marketing. And like, to me, like good copywriters uh, think at that level, you're not right. just thinking about the words you write, you're thinking about the marketing strategy. Yeah. So, so then your sweet spot is to, to kind of lay these, these five different, areas on top of each other and say, okay, there's, there's intersections of how your business strategy, which affects the copy yeah. should change based off of that. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, a good example, right. Uh, recent example for me is, um, I just finished training, um, this client on how to write copy for, um, a math, um, program. And for the last 15, 20 years, she's been teaching kids who are failing at math to um, get better grades and eventually get into Ivy Leagues. Hmm. Expensive program, but like she's super effective and she's turning into an info product. But we were talking like, how can we reach a wider mass market? And it's like, well, I mean, based on every argument you've give me, given me so far, math is the foundation to all your um, thinking and knowledge. And if you actually knew these math tricks, you could increase your productivity. So I'm like, that's a wider market can we shift your program 
it's still teaching math and all the math tricks. Like she can teach you 12 years of schooling into in 12 months, but can we make a switch and make, market this to like the productivity hackers, like the right. life hackers? Yeah. Cause there's a huge market there of people who are, um, what do I call them? They're called uh, slight edge people, right? Th- this is that weird, uh, one two percent of the population who's constantly looking to Kai Zen or improve themselves. Right. Yeah. I bet you can sell it to those people, like the people who buy Jim Quick stuff, right? Or Jim even Quick is all about anyone who self-identifies as being bad at math, which is like, who who do you, you know that doesn't say yeah, that? Yeah, <laughs> we could see. I'm, but my challenge is, I don't want to sell just to the people who think they're bad at math. I want to sell to all the people who want to optimize their life and be better. Okay. Like the, 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 that small, it, it's a small segment, but it's a wider segment than what she's doing right now. Right, right. And, so and, uh, and your, your reasoning for doing that, I would suppose, is so that it doesn't become commoditized and you can keep the price up? I don't know. It's not so much that it's going to get commoditized because what she teaches is unique. It's opening up another market so you can sell to them. Gotcha. So it's kind of like when, you know, in the 70s and 80s, when Nike started selling to China or like Africa or whatever, it's like, the the foundation of capitalism is to expand and grow. So like, how can we do that if we're just aiming for this one market? Right. And for all we know, uh, this market could be a better clientele for her in the long run because maybe she can get to the executive level. Right. Yeah. And yeah. there's just way more money B2B wise. So like as a copywriter, as a direct response copywriter slash marketing consultant, I'm constantly thinking, how can I change a few words in my copy and attack a completely different market? Hmm. And does, that's where this, sorry. No, it's okay. I was just saying, does it really come down to a few words? It seems like almost a, a completely different. Okay, it's not a few words. You have to change the lead, but the, 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 all the work you did for like the arguments and the benefits and the features, you just have to change them around. I see. Um, but like all the core stuff that you did already is still there. Okay. But uh, another good example would be, um, Rosetta Stone or all the language guys back in the early 2010s, they got smart. They started selling not to the people who wanted to travel. They're like, well, improve. like they, they did this thing I'm, I'm suggesting to the mass person, which is make it about self-help, mm-hmm. right? People want to learn languages. Um, and it's a thing people do for quote unquote fun. But like you, you're selling to that identity that they have that they're improving themselves. Right. Yeah. Well, no, I, I think that's a, like you're saying, it's, it's a much larger market because the amount mm-hmm. of people who that's uh, worthwhile for in professional settings is, is massive, even if you're not traveling. Yep. Yeah. yeah. People just want to like say, I speak Spanish or I speak German. It's right. just something you throw at a cocktail parties. And for that segment of the market, they love doing that. They love bragging how they're improving themselves. Right. Cool. Well, we've laid a really good foundation of, of kind of like the concepts that that are involved here, but let's kind of go through the motions. Like if someone wants to do this specifically for, for their own product, like how would you walk them through it? Yeah, for sure. So the first thing you would do is do market research. Like where is the market? Are they even aware they have this problem? How to describe the problem? Uh, like, are they aware of other solutions? So you have to do a lot of competitive research. Mm. So those are the two big intersections. It's like, are one, are they aware of the problem? And two, are they aware of other solutions? And what do they think about their problem? What do they think about the other solutions? And at the end of the day, there's no magic here. It's really just a lot of um, hard work where you're going on forums, subreddits, YouTube videos. Uh, You're looking for people who are describing the problem, trying to pick up on whether they, um, how they describe, how would the, the history of things they've tried, like they'll tell you, like, I tried this, I tried that, that didn't work. Um, and then you, your job is to figure out, do you have competitors? Like, are, do, are there other creators or founders uh, doing the same thing? And how well are they doing it? And are they marketing to the right people? So like, it's always that triangle of product market and the message that you tie the two together. Right. Okay. And it's just it's research. It's research. <laughs> There's no magic to it. It's a, right. it's a lot of grinding. Um, 
some of my copywriters have spent hours watching people talking about their chronic pain on YouTube and it's just to get the words right. Oh, speaking their language. Absolutely. Yeah. And just knowing where they are, like, are they aware, like people, everybody knows Tylenol and Advil, but like, do they know about like natural things that actually work? Right. Um, and do they have, uh, have objections to natural solutions? Right. Cause I mean, you know, mint is apparently something that could help, but like people will go, well, I've tried it. It didn't really work. And I still have pain. Um, and you have to figure out where you stand and where your product stands. Did you say mint? Yeah. So like I could just eat mint oil. Oh, okay. I was thinking like get some York peppermint patties and no, 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 <laughs> no. Uh, All right. CBD also works. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, so you've get, got the market research uh, underway and then where do you go from there? So when you start writing copy, um, you just want to address the, for, for the first opening copy is called the headline and lead. Um, and depending on where they are on the awareness and sophistication level, you want to enter the conversation in their head. That's, a typical line for copywriting training. It's like, are you in the conversation in their head? And if you can say the exact words back to them of what they're going through, what they've tried and didn't mm -hmm. work, then they'll go, you understand who I am and where I'm coming from. So, so this, this will probably just a complete newbie question, but that seems almost like a magic power. Like how, how do you, is it from that research that you're in their head? Yeah, it's from that research. It's gotcha. not magic. Absolutely research. Like um, when I tell students to go through Amazon reviews, I'm telling them if it's more than a um, hundred characters, copy it down and paste into a document. And once you have like, you know, 50 to hundred of these reviews of talking about a particular problem, highlight all the words they use. You're going to see commonalities. I mean, I mm -hmm. did that a lot when I first started. I just went through surveys that my clients had ran on their list and I would read through every single response. And eventually you're going to discover common things they all say, but you're also going to pick up on weird, subtle things. And that's why I recommend all aspiring copywriters to do this. It is because you, you just intuitively, you pick up on certain things. So like, um, for one client, I was reading their surveys and it was very clear to me all of a sudden, like, Oh, they're all very religious. And so knowing that and having gone to church when I was a kid, I, I know a bit of how I could shift that and play that into the copy subtly, not, you know, not overtly because I right. don't want to turn off the non-Christians. Right. Um, another good example was one of my first projects. So I was writing copy for a lawyer who defended veterans who came back from Afghanistan, Vietnam or whatever, and they got injured over there. But the VA is saying, no, you didn't get injured over there. You got injured over here, which is horrible. Right. Yeah. But I got on the phone with like several of the veterans and slowly it dawned on me. Like they're all saying about their youth and their vigor. They gave it up for the country and now they're being betrayed. A lot of them, and I picked up on this, they were talking about their manhood and their, um, their, their ability to be sexual beings. Right. And it was, they never said it. Right. I intuitively I picked up on that. They gave up, they gave up the best years of their life for their country and they got betrayed. Hmm. Um, and, and, and it, I don't know if there's something I can teach, but it is at the end of the day, empathy and I'm like being willing to listen to people to the degree where you pick up on, something else is going on there. Right. Like, yeah. You know, whenever you talk to a new acquaintance or you're just talking to or maybe even like an old friend, you have a baseline and all of a sudden if they shift their tone or their body language, right. You can pick up there's something else there. And if you're smart and you ask the right questions and you've created this safe space where they're open to talking, um, you, they will review stuff. Right. And that's not necessarily a magic trick so much as I don't know if I do it naturally, but I've like, since high school, people have come to me and talked to me about stuff. Mm. And I don't know if it's because I just shut up and listen and I don't like give judgment, but like, that's another 
that's a bit of a woo-woo soft skill that you need as a copywriter slash marketer. It's being able to listen and pick up on things when they go off. Right. Yeah, that active listening and, and being able to pinpoint the right question that comes next. Yeah. Seems and like being that's will, the key. courageous enough to ask it. So like right. I've gotten into trouble before, like because maybe I didn't build up a safe enough space or they didn't see the copywriter as someone important. But I remember some people getting mad at me. It was like, why are you asking me those questions? You have no right to ask me this question. Mm. Um, you're just some writer or whatever. But like, I guess I didn't build the right environment first. And that's important too. Like creating right. that environment where you can ask questions and they're open to answering them. So if people want to find out more about you and, and kind of follow up with this conversation, where, where would you send them? Um, I would probably send them to osmosis.dev. That is my weekly newsletter. I talk about human behavior. I talk about marketing and storytelling. Uh, but every, every week I'm summarizing a chunk of a book, um, just talking about persuasion, manipulation, why we are the way we are. Uh, this whole year, or half of this year, I was summarizing Behave by um, Robert Sapolsky. It's a 700 page book, but it just goes through everything. Like it's a primer on human behavior. It was super fascinating. Um, I know my readers got a lot of, uh, a lot out of it. Uh, they told me to give me feedback. Um, but I, the, I guess that's one last lesson I could leave all your, your audiences. Like if you want to be a good copywriter, you have to be someone who studies human behavior and just co completely fascinated by it. Like hmm. I love eavesdropping. I love <laughs> being that. I love being the flower on the wall and right. just like listening to how people interact and communicate. Yeah. Cause it's just endlessly fascinating to me when, when you start spotting the power dynamics, hmm. like who's in charge, right? Who says they're in charge? Yep. Um, who, who's sucking up to who, um, it's just fun for me to observe those things. Um, so I, I think that's not necessarily a superpower, but it is something that I do naturally as a, um, and I, I guess that's why I got into marketing and copywriting. Well, I, I think that's a perception to detail that can be difficult for some people yeah. in order to, to kind of really, you know, because as, as power dynamics unfold and conversations happen, things go by fast. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're not mm -hmm. quick witted enough to pick up on it, it can, it can be difficult to, to catch up. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I had like the best time and I hope uh, we get a chance to do this again sometime soon. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Hey, thanks so much for being a part of the show today. Now, the worst thing we can do is let all this wisdom pass us by and not act on it. There's so much more to the show, but you'd be missing out if you don't subscribe to the newsletter. This is where you start to leverage these tactics that you've heard in the show in a very real way. So go to leverage3podcast.com and you can join right there on the homepage. Also, please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter where I'm at Craig Shoemaker. I'd love to hear from you. I hope you have a great day. Find someone to love, find someone to forgive and find someone to encourage today. Thanks again. And I'll see you here again soon on the Leverage 3 Podcast.